soul starts to linger It's home, I know If you catch me daydreaming Now and forever Thoughts are carrying me along To that place In midwinter 1793, John Graves Simcoe, the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, took a trip to explore this region, southwestern Ontario. He was very impressed, so much so that he thought this would make a fine site for New London, the proposed capital of Upper Canada. Simcoe's tour guides were native Indians who took him along a trail they called the Longwoods. It followed this river, which we now call the Thames. This well-traveled path began at Burlington Bay at the head of Lake Ontario, meandered southwest into Lake St. Clair and Detroit, and then continued on to the Mississippi. What is most interesting is that the Longwoods Trail had been used for over 2,000 years by the Woodland Indians. It is the same road that brought in white settlement less than 200 years ago. Today's modern highway, which follows much the same route, cuts through one of Canada's most recently formed communities the town of Westminster in the agricultural heartland of Ontario. For David Murray, chores on the farm have to be seen to before his evening commitments. It's all part of a typical day for the mayor of the new town of Westminster. In the Murray family, tradition has always dictated that a stake in the land also means upholding civic duty. It goes with the territory. The family have been in dairy farming ever since about 1919, I believe. And, uh, and we grow some cash crops. Our family have also been involved in politics ever since the turn of the century. My great-grandfather was Reeve of Westminster and Warden of Middlesex County. Our dairy enterprise uh, requires that we milk 50 cows twice a day, every day of the year. We also uh, grow about 400 acres of crops, corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, and alfalfa. This area, south of the city of London, was originally surveyed as Westminster Township in Middlesex County, Canada West. Its first council met in 1817. Now reduced in size, it did at one time front entirely on the Thames River. Growing conditions have made this an attractive farming region since settlers began taking up land in the early 1800s. The family farm continues to prosper here. David makes a point of keeping in touch with his constituents, neighbors. Use of the land in Westminster follows a pattern which can be traced through its multi-layered history. Before today's residents, immigrants from Britain, Scotland, and Ireland joined established loyalist families, refugees from the American Revolution, who occupied the front lots along the river. Simcoe had arranged that the earliest of the land grants be given to a loyalist regiment, Butler's Rangers. Hunting and farming here at the time of the first white settlement were native Indians. They interacted with the pioneers who adopted some of their ways. It wasn't until earlier this century that archaeological findings revealed that these natives 
were descendants of a culture broadly referred to as woodland Indians. The research continues today. Peter Timmons. This site was occupied by uh, Saugeen people who were a middle woodland group um, who lived in the area between about 300 BC and 700 or 800 AD. Um, this particular site uh, dates to the, the early part of that period. It's a, a small campsite um, that was probably used by uh, a group of 25 to 50 people in the uh, late summer and, and fall. They would live here and, and hunt in the surrounding area. And the evidence that we have for this period is that family units were probably um, between six and eight people. Um, it would be, uh, in, in some cases, uh, an extended family, slightly larger than that. They would, they would live in small uh, family units during the winter months um, and then aggregate into to larger uh, band-sized band uh, units of, uh, say, 100 to 300 people in the spring and, and, and live on, on larger sites, usually located uh, along major rivers, uh, quite often in good fishing locations. Although this generation of woodlands was transient, their successors, the Iroquois, were dependent on agriculture and had semi-permanent villages that only had to be relocated when the soil became depleted. By 1842, the population of newly arrived settlers in Westminster had grown to 3,400. Their future also became tied to the productivity of the soil. Sacred to the memory of Hannah Manning, daughter of J.S. and Cornelia Odell, who died March 18th, 1843. These markers down in this corner of the community commemorate many of the family names that can be found in the original survey of Westminster. Names like Dib, Manning, Cole, Wilsey, Dumas, Odell. And if you drive along these side roads, you'll see century farm plaques. These indicate farms that have been in the same family for more than 100 years. And if you look at the mailboxes, at the names on the mailboxes, you'll find that folks around here are not very far from their roots. Here's Orlo Miller, raconteur. So, Butler's Rangers played a big role in this area. You said they saved Canada. Yes. Yes, because they, they were stationed at Fort Niagara. And Fort Niagara was the key to the whole Western country. And the Americans spent the whole eight years of that long, unending war trying to break that hinge. Mm -hmm. And thanks to this little group at Fort Niagara, they never did. The typical ranger tactic was to isolate a community, go in, burn the mills, and disappear. Hit and run. Yeah. And the Americans learned then a lesson they never really did learn, that you cannot win a guerrilla war. So they finished the war. They didn't dare go back to their homes in the Mohawk Valley. Mm -hmm. They were the villains. They were the treacherous ones. They were the black-hearted beasts. So they stayed in Canada. At Lambeth, in the little cemetery at the intersection of the road there, there are two of the rangers buried, Scram and Ding. The village at the crossroads, as Lambeth was once called, was the stagecoach stop connecting the fledgling town of London with the Talbot settlement to the south. It grew to become the farmer's center for the region. Farming up until the Civil War was wheat. This was the granary. This was the granary that supplied the British Army in the war, Crimean War. This was the granary that supplied the Americans until the Kansas fields were opened. And the inevitable happened by the 1850s, we'd worn out our soil. So we had to change. We thought when the Americans went to war against one another, you know, this was going to be a big, a big success. But they didn't want wheat anymore. They had Kansas. What they needed was meat. So we became beef, beef country. Beef, beef, beef. And if you go through this town, 
you'll see older buildings in the 1860s, built in the 18th, magnificent structure. They were built on beef, you see? And then eventually what happens in the 1880s is that again, they run into trouble. Again, they've run out. Again, nobody wants the beef. And so a man called Saunders, who was a, started out as a druggist, and he convinced the farmers to use dairy herbs. And suddenly, cheese making becomes the big deal everywhere, here in this town as elsewhere. Becomes a wave of the future. Cheese, cheese, cheese. Everybody makes cheese like crazy. The Saunders family's influence on the farmer, with Senior becoming head of the Canadian Experimental Farm and his son Charles developing Marquis Wheat, would only be surpassed by the initiative of one William Well. To be taken with salt, an essay on teaching one's grandmother to suck eggs. Strange title. Its author, Peter MacArthur, having worked in New York and in Britain, returned to the family home in Eckford Township, just next door where he'd grown up. He continued his work by writing humorous and witty stories about the everyday happenings along the concession roads here. Until his death in 1925, his column in the Toronto Globe entertained readers through one of his fictional characters, Sir Jingo McBoar. Well, about the same time as MacArthur, the serious side of farming could be read about in this journal, The Farmer's Advocate and Home Magazine. It originated here in Westminster at Weldwood Farm. Lynn Campbell, William Weld, owning a newspaper like this, must have had a great deal more influence than most of the, of the farming community across the country. Oh, I think so. William, William Weld, through the Farmer's Advocate, could talk directly to the farming community and the Farmer's Advocate, as it's claimed, it was one of the largest circulating agricultural journals in Ontario and all across Canada. So he could speak directly to them about ways to improve their farms, about adopting scientific agriculture practices, yeah. crop rotation, soil and water conservation, all kinds of things. And and as a first a monthly and later a weekly news, uh, newspaper, it was there every week. Uh, he was obviously a very successful farmer, but then to start a magazine, a newspaper, was there any publishing in his background? Not that I know of. I, I think the, uh, the publishing business, because of, the, of the, all the experiments going on at Weldwood Farms, the Farmer's Advocate was established, I think, to, to just spread the, uh, the new inf scientific information that they discovered, uh, the successful experiments that they'd conducted at Weldwood Farms. And one of the earliest columns in the Farmer's Advocate is a, is a column called Weldwood Jottings, uh, where Weld talked about his experiments on the farm, his, his experiments breeding uh, purebred shorthorn and Suffolk and sheep and horses as well, and introducing fruit farming and dairy farming. So the, the Farmer's Advocate was really just a way to, to publicize his findings. Published for 100 years, The Advocate continued until 1966. Of the families who settled here in the mid-1800s, there was a man by the name of John Nichols. He, like many of his neighbors, had claimed his 200-acre allotment from the British government. What was to be a new beginning for the Nichols family has led to some interesting, more recent findings. Archaeologists digging at the site of their pioneer homestead have discovered to their surprise that just 40 meters from where that stone foundation was located, the people of the woodlands had built their home 400 years before. Theirs was a longhouse capable of holding nickel log cabin 20 times over. Predating the era of the nickel site is this dig which shows how patterns of civilization are uncovered. Jim Wilson. This is a particularly interesting site, especially this area of the site, because it's totally undisturbed. Uh, 100 year, years ago, or 150 years ago, when they started clearing the forest up in the hills above this area, the spring floods brought down silt and covered up 
the site before the plows could disturb this portion. If you look closely, you can see pieces of pottery sticking out of the wall. This is a rim off one of their pots. And there's another one right here. You can see the designs on the pottery. It's what we call dentate stamp. The site is about 1,800 years old. At the time of Champlain's travels in Canada, it was the Iroquois, known as the people of the Longhouse, who were present. Longhouse referred not only to their habitat, but to their form of government. The Iroquois were people who lived by and from and for the land. The Iroquois were the first peoples among the woodland Indians to conceive of the idea of a confederation. Mm -hmm. The um, Iroquois are extremely important to the whole history of North America because Thomas Jefferson patterned the Constitution of the United States of America on the Iroquois Confederacy. Right. Yeah. And uh, interesting and very significant is the fact that the Iroquois had a very simple method of government. The men made certain conclusions and brought them to the women, who then decided which was the right conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you ever going to be popular with the feminist movement? The Longhouse continues to play a religious and political role in the life of Canada's Six Nations people to this day. It has always been a tradition here in Westminster for the constituents to take an active part in the politics of the community. In going over the names connected with political office here over the years, I find several who have left their mark. John Dearness, for instance, in education. As inspector of schools in Ontario at the turn of the century, he emphasized the need to look to other parts of the world, Sweden, Germany, for instance, for new ideas in building a stronger educational system. Also, there was the McClary family, whose members were Reeves and counselors. Son Oliver, because of illness, gave up teaching and became a tinker, selling tinware on the road. He parlayed this enterprise into a manufacturing concern that carried the McClary name on stoves and utensils well into this century. And then there was the young Irish farmer, who served as one of the township's fence viewers in the 1840s and as a magistrate in 1845, he was shrewd in business. And he would come across the Thames River into London here to sell his barley crop to a small local brewery. Soon, he and a partner bought the place. And the rest, as they say, is history. John K. Labatt and Samuel Eccles, a Westminster neighbor and friend with previous brewery experience, would see their enterprise thrive. The brewery's success was due to its location in the burgeoning hub of London, the availability of water, and a ready supply of barley and hops grown on the land of Westminster. The origin of the soil is due to time and weathering in place. Soil is a living culture made up of humus, bacteria, nutrients, and mineral particles. Without it, life on Earth would be vastly different. In Westminster, the soil is its history. We grow this corn for feed for the cows, and uh, we're pretty well I'm pretty confident that that's going to be a good crop of corn because it's up higher than my knees and it's not yet the 1st of July. The old farmer's axiom that if the corn's as high as your knees, knee high on the 1st of July, that it'll be a good crop.
The soil has sustained a civilization here since before the time of Christ. Today, whether for residents along the side roads or in the small communities, it is what continues to imprint on its people. For they, as we, are a part of it. One of the reasons why I became involved in politics was that I felt a, a civic responsibility. I've always been led to believe, and I think that it's true, that an individual's um, responsibilities go beyond just looking after his own life and his own farm. I have, I have two children. Um, a son and a daughter, of whom I'm extremely proud. I think that, uh, that nothing would make me happier if they would continue on what I guess is a family tradition of involvement in politics and in farming. And so there it is, the woodland people and their predecessors long vanished. For them, the land was a bountiful garden to be harvested with care and wisdom. Their generations felt very much a part of the natural world, investing in it with intelligence and spiritual significance. They too called it home. And then there were the generations of newcomers from Simcoe's day who discovered this new land and claimed their stake in it. For them, it was a new beginning, a renewal. Today, sitting atop a pyramid of time, we have a town preparing for the 21st century, a town built on layers of history and experience. The challenges facing the leaders today are perhaps more complex than ever with numerous influencing factors as to which road to travel. Whatever its chosen paths are to be, perhaps the most important theme we might want to think about is of passing on the torch, our inheritance soon to become the inheritance of the next generation. I'm Harvey Kirk. To that place, to that place, we call home. Down that long road, down that long road, throughout life, we 